lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Yes, I know Bob Cornuke. I did one or two conferences with him, I think in the UK. Uh, that was myself, him, Chuck Missler, and so forth. I like Bob Cornuke very much, and I appreciate the fact he was one of those who exposed the fraudster, the charlatan, uh, who claimed to have discovered the Holy Ark and Pharaoh's chariots and so forth, Ron Wyatt. He was one of the people who exposed Ron Wyatt. I do not dislike Bob Cornuke personally, and I make no judgments about his motives, none, none at all. He's a very nice person. And he has made contributions, at least to the exposition of the fraud, Ron Wyatt. Bob Cornuke was from a police investigative background, and that well equipped him to be one of the people who debunked a con artist in the person of Ron Wyatt, who was largely financed by Seventh-day Adventist interests and so forth. Nonetheless, Bob Cornuke has proposed a third theory as to the location of the Second Temple. Now, until now, there have been two predominant theories. Why do we even discuss this? We discuss it because of the Tribulational Temple, likely referred to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in the book of Daniel, but also most conspicuously in Revelation chapter 11. There almost certainly will be a Tribulational Temple in fact, I'm quite confident that there will be. Nonetheless, the two essential schools of argumentation as to its specific location both place it on the existing Temple Mount. The existing Temple Mount being an expansion by Herod the Great, who built a retaining wall around the Temple Mount, filling it in around the bedrock creating what to this day remains the world's largest man-made plateau. This is the Temple Mount, known in Hebrew as Har Habayat. To the north would have been the Fortress Antonio. One school of thought follows the not long ago deceased Israeli archaeologist, Dr. Asher Kaufman. Dr. Asher Kaufman. Dr. Asher Kaufman would have placed the temple approximately 70 meters to the north of the existing Dome of the Rock, the Mosque of Omar, which has an inscription from the Quran that God has no son, he is not begotten, neither does he beget, which according to John's epistle is a hallmark of Antichrist denying the father-son relationship right on the Temple Mount. Dr. Kaufman placed it 70 meters north, and a number of archaeologists agreed with him. Others contested it. The strength of his argument archaeologically rests on the fact that Herodian stones were discovered underneath the existing Golden Gate, or East Gate, known in Hebrew as Hashar Harakamim, the present East Gate. Those stones were discovered by the Christian archaeologist, Dr. James Fleming. This presents fairly solid support to the contention that the East Gate in the time of Jesus was on the location of the present East Gate. There would have been a bridge crossing to the cleft of the Mount of Olives. The other point of view is the one by Dr. Dan Bahat, who I have met. Professor Bahat was associated with the Department of Antiquities of Hebrew University, very eminent archaeologist, again, Jewish, <laughs> but friendly to Christians and friendly to evangelicals. And he has been associated with the model maker, probably the best model 
of the Temple Mount and Second Temple Period Jerusalem of Alex Garrod, which is located in Suffolk, England. Professor Bahat would have placed the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock is. His argument is supported by the cleft of the Mount of Olives, where the high priest had to sacrifice the red heifer and look directly through the east gate into the Holy of Holies. This argument depends on whether you believe that the beautiful gate was the east gate or the Nicanor gate, which would have been further to the south. This is the argument. Two main schools. If Asher Kaufman's school of thought is correct, proven to be correct, it would allow for the construction of a third temple without destroying or dismantling the Dome of the Rock. This would appear to fit the prophecies of Revelation 11 that the outer court would be given to the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. In any event, these are the two main schools of thought. Bob Cornuke, an associate of Chuck Missler, and again, a nice person from a criminal investigation background. I do not know if he has a degree in archaeology, frankly. I should know, but I cannot find out. Now maintains that neither is correct, that the temple was located further to the south on the top of what is known as the city of David, today the Islamic village of Silwan, that area. It would have placed it in the area biblically known as the Milu, the Milu, which I'll explain more in a moment. His essential contention is that the volume of water needed for the drainage system to clean away the blood from the sacrificial rituals that went on continually by the Levites could only be gotten from the spring of Gihon, which of course fed Hezekiah's tunnel and had its uh, point of destination as the pool of Siloam or Shiloach, meaning apostle in Hebrew essentially, Shaliach, Shaloach, the one who was sent, called the pool of Siloam in most English translations. The pool of Siloam would have been just to the north of the area in scripture Jesus referred to in what was known as Gehenom, Gehenom, the public rubbish tip, but also a cursed area because of the ashes and bones of the baby sacrifice to Molech in the days of King Manasseh and so forth. It would have been also rather close to Hakel Dama, where Judas was, of course, hung and so forth. This would have been outside the original refuse gate or dung gate. We today have the Pool of Siloam, approximately the original one, 80% excavated, and the excavations are still going on. Quite an incredible discovery and something well worth seeing. Do not miss it if you are on a pilgrimage or a Bible study tour of Jerusalem. Nonetheless, we have the Pool of Siloam, we have Hezekiah's tunnel, we have the spring of Gihon coming in, bringing the water from the middle Kidron to the lower city of David. There. Bob Kornu contends that this had to be the water source for the temple, for there was no other one. His other argument is that the garrison of 10,000 Roman legionnaires, 6,000 at arms, plus approximately 4,000 support troops could not have been billeted within the Fortress Antonio. It just would have been too small. That appears to be his other argument. Both of these arguments are devoid of any historical, Mishnaic, or archeological support. Let me begin, please, with his arguments concerning the water. It is true that we have the Pool of Siloam, the water source 
from the uh, spring of Gihon, coming from the Kidron through Hezekiah's tunnel, excavated. You can walk through it. I've been in it. We've led tour groups through it and so forth, Bible study groups. Many people will have been there. Some of the people listening will have probably gone through it. That is very true, but that is only true for the city of David. His contention that there could be no other water source required for the drainage system of the temple is absolutely, absolutely, once again, devoid of fact and fundamentally disproven. Bob's assertion is opposed by Dr. Randall Price. I know Randall Price. I've done a few conferences with him as well. Also a very nice gentleman, and he has the distinguished honor of being the main evangelical representative on the Qumran Excavations Committee. He's a brother of some prestige in scriptural archaeology, and he holds a lot of credence with Jewish scholars and archaeologists. He's well known to the Department of Antiquities at Hebrew University, the Holy Land Institute, the Albright Institute, etc. None of these institutions, none of them, lend any credence to the theory of Bob Cornuke whatsoever. I've repeated multiple times that as a basic rule of thumb, all kinds of rumors, even conspiracy theories, circulate out of Jerusalem about this and that and something having been discovered and so forth. The rule of thumb is this. If it is not published in Biblical Archaeology Review, ignore it. I'm not saying take it with a grain of salt. I'm saying if it's not published in Biblical Archaeology Review, you can pretty well ignore it. That is the gold standard. Nonetheless, let's continue. We have an elaborate drainage system with elements not only of the second temple's drainage system for the temple, but even Solomon's that are exposed in digs viewable through observation wells along the street of the chain. The street of the chain runs from Damascus Gate to the Kotel, to the Plaza of the Wailing Wall. And you can see these drainage systems. They are large and significant. The notion that they were only there for stagnant water, as Bob Cornu contends, is unsupportable. You do not have such drainage systems excavated on the South Temple Mount excavations or in the city of David. They are only adjacent to the Temple Mount. Also, we have the presence of the ruins of Robinson's Arch, connecting the upper city and the priestly quarter with the Temple Mount. Again, supporting the location of the Temple Mount. The idea, where did they get the water then? If the temple was that far up, how could they possibly get water to it if it's on top of a mountain overlooking the Kidron? You could only get the water from the Gihon. This is utter nonsense. If you were to go to the present Kotel, that is the plaza in front of the Wailing Wall, the western retaining wall of the Temple Mount. And again, the size of the Herodian stones gives us a picture of what Jesus was referring to when the apostles were commenting on the size of the stones. The largest stone of the temple uh, was substantially bigger than the largest stones of the great pyramid of Cheops. Today, even in the Wailing Wall, there is one stone 44 times heavier than the largest stone found in the Great Pyramid at Giza. Why would you build a retaining wall when there was nothing up there? Nonetheless, let's begin at the Kotel, that is the Wailing Wall. Adjacent to it is an archaeological tunnel. It actually does have passageways that are secret because of the political sensitivity of some of the digs allegedly terrestrially going underneath the Temple Mount, being subterranean, close to the public, branching off of the rabbi's tunnels entranceways. 
uh, there's a cluster of payments as, as, as the entrance foyer into the rabbi's tunnel itself. This is the story. It may be true. I believe there's at least an element of truth to it. Nonetheless, the rabbi's tunnel is open to the public. You walk through it. It comes adjacent to the area where Asher Kaufman would have placed the Holy of Holies, something today underneath the Dome of the Spirits. It has an Arabic name, the Dome of the Spirits, which was where the bedrock met the filled-in area of the Temple Mount uh, on the plateau, um, which is where Asher Kaufman would have placed the Holy of Holies, and it's marked in the Rabbi's Tunnel. It runs from south to north, parallel to the Wailing Wall. In fact, it's a continuation of the Wailing Wall. As you walk along it and through this rather dark and narrow tunnel, you proceed north to the area where the Fortress Antonio was. When you get to the end of the Rabbi's Tunnel, before exiting on the present Via della Rosa, which was almost certainly not the biblical one, but when you exit on the Via della Rosa, you do so not by coming directly out of the tunnel. You need to venture through, walk through, a huge underground cistern reservoir that dates back to the Hasmonean period. A huge underground water storage facility. Still there, you walk through it and you see its dimensions when you exit the rabbi's tunnel. When you come out of the rabbi's tunnel, underneath the area, archaeologists tell us, was the location of Fortress Antonio. And again, these things are supported by the descriptions of both Josephus and the Mishnah and the New Testament. When you come out, the Gospel records, when you come out onto the present Via della Rosa, Near the second century reconstruction of the Ecce Homo Arch, you will come to the area known as the Lathasistras, the Lathasistras. You can see the etchings in the stone of the 10th Roman Legion where they played the circle game with dice, gambling for Jesus' clothes. We do not know if these are first or second century inscriptions or a second century reconstruction of first century inscriptions using or reusing the same stones, which is very typical in Israel, particularly in Jerusalem. Nonetheless, we're reasonably assured this was the location of Fortress Antonio. In fact, it's proven. It's proven. It's proven. If you were to make a right onto the Via della Rosa a short distance, Approximately 160 meters, let's call it 180 yards, not more. You would come to a courtyard with a crusader church called St. Anne's. <clears throat> Built in crusader times for its acoustics. It's rather amazing that something could be built so long ago and have perfect pitch acoustics in its reverberation due to the type of stone used and also the contour of the architecture. Pilgrim groups, Bible study groups go in there and sing hymns and it sounds quite beautiful, sung archipelago. It's run by um, French Canadian monks. It's a Catholic place, but directly on back of it, directly on back of it is the well excavated the very well excavated Pool of Bethesda, House of Grace, where the hospital was from John chapter 5. This pool is more than six times the size of the Pool of Siloam. This is more than six times the size. Even closer, slightly to the east, would have been something known as the Pool of of Israel, still not excavated, but we have Mishnaic references as to where it was, adjacent what was then the Sheep Gate. The Sheep Gate. That would have been the gate 
that the Israeli paratroopers entered approximately the same location, not the same gate, but approximately the same location, where the Israeli paratroopers entered in 1967, capturing the old city and the Welling Wall and the Temple Mount. This pool was more than 10 times the size of the Pool of Saw. Not only that, but we also have something near the Tower of David, the Citadel of David, which would have been the Herodian Palace, where one of the trials of Jesus would have taken place, according to the Gospels, with this Hezekiah's pool. This is elevated in the new quarter, as it was called then, which was the northern side of the upper city. And a downgrade could have brought that water easily into the Temple Mount. Nonetheless, the most likely source of water for the Temple Mount were the large pools of Israel and Bethesda, or what fed them, a tributary of the Brook of Kidron coming from the upper Kidron Valley, known in scripture as the Valley of Yehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat. You can look at this on any second temple period map of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. There's not an archeologist who doesn't know these things. The fundamental premise of Bob Cornuk, that the water had to come from the spring of Gihon at a more Southern point, is absolute nonsense. Water was much more plentiful on the northern side. The pools were bigger and more robust. We even have a cistern that you can walk through. That's Hasmonean. That was pre-Second Temple period and existing there in the Second Temple period. The size of the drainage system shows the volume of water being moved was considerable. It wasn't just stagnant water. This is bogus archaeology. It's hard for me to believe that any archaeologist would say this. Now, my background is in biomedical sciences and in theology and Judaism. But I have learned a considerable amount of archaeology, both in seminary and on location in Jerusalem. For years, I led Bible study tours. I knew many Israeli tour guides, but not only tour guides, tour guides trained by the best archaeologists, and I've met some of the best archaeologists, including Dr. Dan Bahat. Dr. John Wood has another evangelical archaeologist. Nobody lends credence to what's being maintained by Bob Cornuk. Chuck Missler does, some other people may do, but nobody working in archaeology or serious Second Temple period history lends any credence to it. His arguments about the size of the Fortress Antonio and its incapacity to garrison 10,000 legionnaires with their support troops is again, spurious, baseless. When we read Josephus, Wars of the Jews, we know what happened. There was a convergence of elements of the 10th Legion some of them had fought in Galilee. Some, in fact, a main body of them were garrisoned on the coastal port city of Caesarea Maritina, a far bigger city than Jerusalem where Pontius Pilate had resided during the time of Jesus. These converged on Jerusalem for a siege. They were not garrisoned inside the Fortress Antonio. When we read the Wars of the Jews, Jerusalem was surrounded in direct fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus. We know there were garrisons on Haratzophim, Mount Scopus. That is the northern peak of Harzayatim, the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is divided between the main peak on the south, then there is a gulch, and then there is Haratzophim present location of the main campus of Hebrew University. That area, overlooking the Valley of Jehoshaphat, that is the Upper Kidron. We know 
That was the Roman observation point. That's what they call it Mount Scopus, Scopus, looking out. The Romans are actually able to see over the walls into the city of Jerusalem. You can visit that area today. There's a large NOF, a large public observation deck near the British War Cemetery from the First World War, in the time of General Allenby. You can go there and see for yourself exactly what Josephus described. The headquarters of Titus was on the west side, near the present King David Hotel. That had been the headquarters not only of Titus, but of the British Mandate government that was blown up by Menachem Begin and Edson Svidumi during the Israeli War for Independence and the events, or just before it. Uh, the area around the King David Hotel. The area today is called Mamilla. Mamilla is a shopping mall, hotel, and so forth, leading up to the King David Hotel. And across the street is probably the nicest and most elaborate YMCA in the world. That whole area was a huge Roman garrison, according to Josephus. To say that these had to be stationed in the Fortress Antonio is crazy. The Fortress Antonio had at one point had to be abandoned by the Romans. They were not there. This is silly. It is silly what he's saying. Now this has caused considerable contention. I believe some of it may have become personal between uh, Randy Price, Dr. Randall Price, and Bob Cornuke. That's unfortunate, and I don't wish to be party to any personal disputes or arguments. I'm simply dealing with historical, Mishnaic, and archaeological facts. Going back to the archaeology, not only is the pool of Siloam, Shiloach, 80% excavated now, and again, you must see it if you're in Jerusalem, but what's also excavated is living proof of the historicity of John 7. The processional stairway from the Pool of Siloam up to the Temple Mount, where the Simcha Bet HaShoeva ritual of pouring the water out on the Temple Mount would have taken place, with the Levites leading the procession. It was against this background that Jesus said, I will give you living water in John chapter 7 totally excavated. You can stand at the base of it and look up to the Temple Mount or just outside of it. Between the Temple Mount and the City of David is the area filled in by Solomon called the Milu, the Milu. We know what it looked like before it was filled in, and it was probably filled in, or certainly was filled in repeatedly after the time of Solomon, but Solomon initially filled it in. If you were to go to the southeastern corner of the present walls of Jerusalem, where the east gate is going south, the eastern wall overlooking the Kidron, and where the southern wall meet, that would have been the area where the Apostle James had been martyred. You can see what it would have looked like before it was filled in. You see from the perspective of geomorphology, what the land would have looked like before people filled it in. You see how deep it was. There was a crevice. It's as you go west towards the existing Dungate, outside of the southern Temple Mount excavations, south of the Wailing Wall and so forth, and proceed further west to the present Mount Zion, not to be confused with the scriptural one, which was the Temple Mount, quite certainly, you will still have a middle, a filled in area. Some excavations are there, but you don't find any drainage system. You don't find any support structures for large buildings the way you do on the Temple Mount and with the Southern Mount excavations. Not only that, once you go inside the Dungate, you'll see on the right the Southern Temple Mount excavations. You will see Flinderstones, still there, Flinderstones, 
formed by fire, which the archaeologists tell us, tell us, is from 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the temple and the surrounding area with intense heat, causing a crumbling of the stone structures supporting the temple and its ancillary facilities. It's still there. You can pick them up and look at them. It's illegal to take them. They're considered archaeological property of the Department of Antiquities, but you can certainly see them and handle them. Tour guides, archaeologists can show them to you. I've seen them many times. Not only that, but a large stone with an inscription showing where the shofar was blown was found at that point. Again, on the southern access of the existing Temple Mount near the present Mosque of Aqsa, the Mosque of Aqsa. Outside of the Mosque of Aqsa, you see where the gates were. It's imprinted in the stones and the steps going up that Jesus would have walked on. My son was bar mitzvahed on those steps. Everyone knows about those steps. They're exactly what is described both in the Mishnah and by Josephus. It's where the high priest would have stood above the city of David, giving the blessing coming out of the temple. You have the gate for entering and the gate for coming out. Fully, fully consistent with the archaeology is the historical and Mishnaic records. To say that the temple was just to the south of that is unsupportable. It makes no sense. You've got the steps going up to get to the temple. This is bogus. These contentions are, and frankly, they're ludicrous, they're absurd. I'm not saying this to offend Bob Cornuke personally. I like him personally. I appreciate his help in exposing uh, Ron Wyatt. I make no judgments as to his motives, and I'm not trying to offend Chuck Missler or other people who attribute some credibility to these fanciful theories. But based on all historical and archaeological and mystic records, they are complete and utter nonsense. Again, as a detective, as a forensic police investigator, Bob might have been the right guy to go after a fraud like Ron Wyatt. But his archaeology is bogus. It's just not real. Now, he admits in his book, it doesn't matter anyway, because unbelieving Jews are going to build the temple up on the Temple Mount anyway. Well, then what's the point? Nonetheless, what he says, it cannot possibly be right. It cannot possibly be right. These prophecies of Daniel 9, of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and of Revelation chapter 11, and of the book of Ezekiel, are very, very important in future prophecy. They're important in contemporary events in the Middle East, setting the stage for future prophecy to be fulfilled. They're not something to be handled lightly or made light of, dealt with in an irresponsible, academically unsupportable manner. Pseudo-scholarly nonsense should have no place in biblical archaeology, none. Again, if these things were not of prophetic significance, I wouldn't care about it. But they are of prophetic significance. No, the temple is not what Bob Cornuke says. Absolutely not. The water would have been more easily obtainable from the water table coming from the upper Kidron that fed the Pool of Bethesda and the Pool of Israel which are geographically closer to the Temple Mount, the existing one, than the Pool of Siloam. Not only that, but you have a downgrade through Hezekiah's tunnel. 
gravity carried the water to the pool of Siloam from the spring of Gihon. How would you get the water upgraded contrary to gravity to the Temple Mount? How would you get it up there? Even if it was at the top of the city of David, it would be too far. It would be an upgrade. How would you move the water to the top of the city of David where he would place the temple? Uh, but if you have the source of water from the upper Kidron that fed the much larger pools of Israel and Beth Hesda, almost adjacent to the Fortress Antonio and the northern access to the Temple Mount as it exists even today, it will be much more sensible, much easier, much more explicable. We even have other archaeology showing the availability of water sources. The pool of Hezekiah is excavated, and the Hasmonean cistern, that is the underground reservoir, at the uh, lower portion inside the city of the Tyropean Valley, you actually walk through it before you exit the rabbi's tunnel onto the Via de la Rosa at the Lafasastras. I'm not saying this to offend either Bob Cornuke or my friend Chuck Missler. They're brothers in Christ, no personal issue. I'm strictly speaking about historical, Mishnaic, and archaeological reality. These things are nonsense. Complete and utter nonsense. I must agree with Dr. Randolph Price and with others who take issues with it. Again, I've led tours in Israel for years. I've met some of the finest archaeologists, and I've read all of them, both Jewish and Christian. Nobody, nobody who knows what they're doing, who really knows what they're talking about, will ascribe any real endorsement to these theories. They're just not plausible. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. 
the snatching away, which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.